Mario Blasad, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. We want to start our conversation with you today about your book, Storytelling, Globalization, in the Chaco and Beyond. Um, you spent a significant amount of your early career um, working as an anthropologist with the Ishiro in the Paraguayan uh, Chaco region. And in 2010, you published this book detailing your ethnographic, theoretical, philosophical aspects of that um, field work. And in it, you discuss uh, various aspects of um, colonization, decolonization in the context of development and an area of study that um, you and others call political ontology. Um, and all of this work in this book has continued and changed um, in your later work in new forms, changing forms. Um, but we want to go back a little bit just to the start um, and ask you, what was your initial approach to your work um, with the Ashiro in the Chaco? Um, how did you come to this community as an anthropologist um, with your upbringing and your context, um, maybe in a context that you might describe in the book as a modern context? Um, and what were you going to do as a Western anthropologist working with this indigenous people and community? Well, um, the the way in which I arrived at, uh, to those particular communities was very um, um, just by chance, in a way. I, I, I got a job, uh, a summer job, while I was a student in Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina, doing my undergrad, uh, licenciatura. And I got this job as a tourist guide in a boat that uh, traveled from Asuncion City all the way the Paraguay River to Corumbá in Brazil uh, and was stopping at different communities. Um, and in those travelings during that summer, um, a few uh, Ishiro people were jumping into the boat uh, to sell handicrafts to the tourists. And I became friends because I kept coming back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so we became friends. Uh, I told them about um, that I was doing my studies in anthropology, and one of them told me, oh, that's what we need, an anthropologist of all the necessities of life, you know, that uh, uh, was uh, <laughs> very fundamental. Um, then I realized why in Argentina and in many uh, Latin American countries, anthropology and social science in general, I think, have a background that is uh, predominantly Marxist. And so the, the way in which I approach, uh, or the way that I imagined that I, what I was doing uh, as an anthropologist was, uh, well, I was going to study, see how I could contribute to the liberation of these uh, oppo oppressed peoples uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that, that was my, my, my initial kind of very naive uh, presumption of what was the role of uh, an anthropologist uh, in in uh, in those times, no. But very quickly, it it just uh, was the confronting the reality and how the people in the communities understood their own position and where they were situated. That it very quickly turned around my presumptions. Well, very quickly. No, it, it was very quick that I realized that something was not working. It, it took a, a few years into that I started to to understand. Okay, well, maybe I'm coming really, uh, really bad at this. Um, and so that's that's where uh, the whole thing of starting to to really consider. Okay, where I'm coming from? What I'm? What, what are my own uh, presumptions? And why do I have these presumptions? Where do they come from? start to trigger a whole process of, uh, rather than uh, fundamentally studying them, it was like confronting a mirror, a distorted mirror in a way and say, okay, wh wh where I'm coming from and how I'm part of all this that I am at the same time supposedly coming to try to, to uh, address, um, I'm very much part of it. All right, thank you. Um, so I think before we get into the kind of thinking that you developed after this, um, this sort of process and learning process, 
um, with the Ishiro, um, we want to ask how you analyze other forms of academic like philosophy and scholarship and like theorization that even when they're trying to do, as you say, like this liberation. The, the, the way in which I have ended up looking or un understanding with an image for me, it's like a dog chasing its own tail. Uh, so you see there a problem, <laughs> there is a tail, you know, you see a problem, oh, oh, I'm going to go after that. And you don't realize that it's, it's part of your own. And so you go chasing it and chasing it around and perhaps not really taking into account the mess that you are making at the same time that you are going around. Perhaps in distinction to other versions of anthropologies that have been more, you know, okay, let's go study and understand the others, you know, and, and, and generating all these very fabulous ethnographies about how the others think. The kind of anthropology that I was coming from was first, it would um, um, blame those anthropologies as very colonial. Oh, you are treating the others as objects to enrich yourself, you know, somehow enrich yourself intellectually or whatever. And, and so from that critique come this other mode of doing anthropology that was, okay, we have to be more on the, on the reality of what is happening on the ground and look, capitalism, what it's doing, destroying these ways of life. And so uh, we have to intervene there. So we have a responsibility to intervene there. But what I, what I confront is that uh, actually we were already defining what was the problem and not taking into account how people on the ground or these communities were defining the problem that they faced themselves. And that's where, you know, it was something that perhaps those all anthropologists that were uh, analyzing more the what was called at that time the worldviews of others would pay more attention, and so for me it, it was a, a matter of retrieving a little bit of that um, that suspicion that well not everybody uh, lives in the same world or understand the world in the same way. At, at the beginning was that was the terms that in which I thought it, not everybody understands in the same way the world. Uh, but that just already opened the possibility, you know, to start contesting uh, my own assumptions about what was going on in the terrain. The main limitation I find in, in, in many uh, other approaches that um, they very unwittingly, they just go around with its own presumptions. Okay, the world is what I know what it is, and that's it. So in your book, um, you describe a little bit of this um, clash of what we might consider worldviews, um, but that's the perspective that you were kind of grappling with and maybe trying to move beyond, that um, when you engaged with uh, Ishiro people, um, you, you noticed that they didn't necessarily see themselves as victims of white capitalist oppression, colonialism, globalization. Um, and the way you describe it in the book, as you were just talking about, is that uh, Western anthropologists, and including you yourself, might have initially thought of that as like an anomaly, um, that like the worldviews weren't lining up and that like there's there's a reality out there that we just aren't like on the same page about. And so if they don't think of themselves as victims of white capitalist oppression, that's just a little weird and we're not going to think about that. Um, and so I'm wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about in this particular case, what were, or what did you come to find the Ishiro approach to their relationship to colonialism, globalization? Um, what was that like through your, your dialogue and your conversation and your work? Um, and how did that grow beyond this idea of like it as an anomaly, right? Maybe to the idea of it as differing worlds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, like the, the, the registering that as, a, as an anomaly in principle, you know, it has to do with this, uh, uh, well, quickly, you have to explain an anomaly, you have to explain it. And there is all kind of explanations, you know, for, oh, I come here, we know that there is capitalism, look, the uh, agribusiness here destroying, blah, 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 you know, paying a pittance to these people to work uh, if they are even paid. So it's obvious what's going on. And yet these uh, people are not talking of their bosses, you know, as uh, exploiting them. Uh, okay, how do I explain that? So that's the usual um, usual anthropological move, uh, explain the anomaly. Ex and the, the anomaly, it, 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 there is a, a play of position here between the, the ethnographer and the audience that the ethnographer has in the mind. So because in a way, I have to explain to you that share the same, um, let's say, uh, assumptions than me, how these people come to have these strange ideas you know, so I need to, to do an explanation. But that's what I started to see was like, okay, what I'm doing is explaining away a reality. Because the only thing that I'm doing in that process of explaining away is reinforcing what you and I, you as an audience and me as an ethnographer, take for granted. Um, and in the first entry into that, 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 that anomaly might be something else. It was not necessarily that it, can, it could be something else in the sense of, wow, another reality that opens. But the first thing that attracted me is that when I started to perceive that the not accepting uh, the kind of critique that I was proposing for their situation, it didn't mean that they didn't have a critique. They had a critique that to me was much more powerful than the one that I was bringing. That was the first thing that I started to, to see. Wow, this, is, this goes much deeper. The critique that they are making of what's going on goes much deeper than what I can, and many of the frameworks that I'm bringing can, can fathom. Because they were going to a profoundly moral critique of the kind of relations that were being established there and the kind of consequences that that had for the world. And at the same time, they, by refusing to engage um, kind of in a um, antagonistic mode with what I saw as their oppressors, they were pointing to another world. So it was like start to think, okay, what in what world does it make sense that you don't have to go just and go in a way go kill this all these busters that are exploiting you? And so that's where where it triggered me, you know, start to okay, what okay, what is that world? How can I I, I grasp what is going on? But it was it's, in a way once I entered that, it was never uh, simply about oh, I want to understand that world so that I can tell others about that world like a traveler, you know. It was always, okay, what that critique might bring to the world in which I live. Perfect. And you you describe this effect sort of, of like how that critique sort of blends into your own world as part of a, as part of a larger project that you've developed with yourself and others, um, what you call the pluriverse, um, the pluriverse. And so how, how does that pluriversal view emerge? Like, how does it differ from just, just encountering people versus actually working together to let that world sort of affect yours and, and together emerge something new? Mm -hmm. Um, there is many, many, many facets to it, and I'm still working through uh, the consequences of thinking uh, or, the, or, or of proposing the pluriverse. One, one of the elements that play out in this process that I was telling you about, um, you know, getting the, the kind of critique that they are producing is much more profound and intense than what 
I could have thought before of their situation. Um, it was when I start to, 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 to grasp a little bit of what, what are the foundations of it, um, it started to come a profound uh, concern for um, sustaining a set of relations in place and very specific and very particular to the place. Uh, and to the place, not I'm, I'm not talking just geographically, but it, it, place in the sense uh, of uh, a sense of place, of where, where is the world in which I, I am. And so when, when I started to pay attention to that aspects of their mode of engagement with, uh, you know, what I have taken first as capitalism, and then I started to, to understand it more as modernity and not modernity as um, it's, it's, it's just a label to, to speak about practices and modes of doing things uh, that are done um, and that express some basic presumptions. Uh, and one of the central presumptions of, of uh, doing modernity is this nature cultural divide, the notion that you have a reality out there, you know, and uh, a series of perspectives in your mind, which is all connected to, to these things that I was mentioning before, you know, about how we, how we go out to the field thinking that uh, we know this or we know that and how we can explain better and so on and so forth. Once I, I started to, to get a little bit of a sense of uh, what was the different grounding of the Ishiro or some of the Ishiro critique of their of the situation in which they live? It became um, visible for me that uh, the notion of a world out there, a reality out there, and a representation was not the sort of things that they were operating on. There was a, 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 rather the notion that they have was much more about sustaining that the world that they live in has to be sustained and sustained through practices. And, and then, I mean, like how, how, how that go connecting with the idea of pluribus, you know, was, okay, this is done always in the particular. It's always done in specific modes, repeats in different places. Uh, the worlds that are being produced by uh, these communities are not exactly the same worlds that are being produced by Guarani-speaking peasants that were neighboring the communities. Um, and so all, all these ways of, uh, uh, of being and practicing uh, lives um, just started to paint the picture of, uh, of something that was not a universe, but were a multiplicity of worldings, uh, which end up we ended up uh, taking that word of pluriverse to to refer to it. No, I think this idea maybe for anybody listening who isn't already familiar with um, like the pluriverse or political ontology might be a little jarring. At least it was for me at first, and I still don't think I really have my head grasp around it. Um, but the idea of doing worlds like performing um things into being like that's very profoundly like runs against as you say like the the practices of modernity and so a, a paper that you've written a little bit more recently um is called uh doing and undoing caribou slash atiku i i believe it's pronounced um and i wonder if we could get a little bit more into what does it mean to perform? Like, what is ontological about these? Um, what does it mean to say that these conflicts are ontological? Um, maybe through the example of the uh, the work you did um, with caribou slash atiku, what does it mean to say that we are performing caribou? And what does it mean to say that another world is performing something that we would think of as the same object differently? The, the, the big challenge for those of us who have uh, been raised within the modern myth, that is our basic presumption, is extremely hard to imagine 
um, you know, what what is this idea of the pluriverse and what is this idea of worlding rather than worlds that already precede us? And, and part of the difficulty is that is these are ontological questions in the sense that are uh, the most basic presumptions about what is reality and how reality operates. So there is no way to begin with of uh, uh, comparing. There is no way to say what ontology is goes or it doesn't go. Uh, it's a proposal. Any ontology, in a way, is a proposal that you have to go with it or not. I, I just put this out because it's not a matter of making an argument against the universe and say, oh, no, no, reality is not like this. Actually, reality is like this. If I, if I were to say that, I would be contradicting myself immediately. Okay. So the, the point is about saying, um, okay, this is a proposal of how the world might be. And the crucial key of the proposal is to see where it takes us and whether it might do worlds differently. Already we are assuming that this proposal makes different kinds of worlds. Now, one way in which I explain to my students when they first come to these notions, try to imagine reality as a soup, a primigenous soup, like a notion in which there are waves that raise, okay? And those waves are existence that might look at the other waves and say, oh, look there, another wave. Oh, look down there, the ocean without realizing that they are very much part of it. And so, you know, this is, this is how reality, reality is in this proposal, reality in the pluriversal and becoming way is that, is that, is that soup constantly uh, racing uh, in waves that are part of that soup all the time. There is nothing that is really outside there. Um, and those, uh, ways we can thinking the, the the way perhaps of approaching it is, is is practices, and it's not it's practices, movements um, that are not undertaken by humans alone. Uh, that are assemblages, entire assemblages, um, of what afterwards we call humans and non-humans, and we do a whole series of partitions of these things. That's the sense in which perhaps one can start to approach to this. Uh, now, these realities are done differently. For example, with the case of the of the Atiku and and, and Karibu that you mentioned, and very briefly uh, for your audience, the conflict that I'm looking at in that in that article is between the Inu nation in Labrador and uh, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, who, because a, 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 a caribou herd uh, was declining, uh, they put a ban on hunting uh, caribou, uh, which the Inu have rejected because for the Inu, this entity to which they relate, which is Atiku, that in principle, Europeans, Euro, Euro Canadians will say it as, okay, these are the two words for the same thing. So Atiku and and caribou are the that thing. If I say the animal, I, I am already giving the game because I am already putting it in the in the realm of the Euro Canadians because it's uh, in the Inu world is not an animal; it's something else. It's Atiku. So uh, basically, I'm looking at that at that conflict because it's, it's very interesting how they cross because both. Uh, the government, which are wildlife managers and the Inu hunters, are concerned about the decline of the population. But because the entity is not the same, the way they go about trying to address that problem is completely different. For wildlife managers, uh, the problem, part of the problem, have to do with hunting. Too much hunting in the middle of uh, climate change and so on and so forth. Uh, no, that's has to be prohibited. But for the Inu, the decline on the animals is because the younger generation of Inu are not relating with the spirit owner of 
article in the proper way. So they need to teach them properly. And to do it, they need to hunt. So you see, if both are concerned uh, about that entity in very different ways, but all the set of practices that are associated with those entities are different. They, they touch in some points, but, you know, um, for example, caribou, you don't have to entice a spirit master for it to reproduce. Article you need to. Uh, likewise, uh, for article, you have to um, hunt and share the meat in generous ways for biologists in caribou, that's completely relevant. So when you look at this set of practices, you see that the, it's like a two, two networks that overlap in a body. Now, uh, a modernist view would say, OK, whatever, these are perspectives on the thing. There is a thing there. The problem is that uh, who can point to the thing by itself? The things are always in a network. Things are always in an assemblage. You cannot distinguish. Uh, there is nothing that holds by itself uh, in a vacuum. So um, I don't know if that, that makes sense. I mean, there is, uh, in that, in that uh, article, there is a, an image that I use all the time, everywhere I'm using it. I'm trying to finish a book now. I use it there too, which is of a, of a duck and rabbit, uh, which is a way in which I can't, I, I try to get across the idea of the, of the pluriverse because one of the misunderstandings that happens when we talk about the pluriverse is many Many times people imagine that we are talking about like billiard balls, like all these worlds that are, you know, secluded and, you know, they can bounce against each other, but they are all self-contained. And that's not it at all. Uh, the pluriverse is like all the time entanglement, all the time. But the point is that those entanglement doesn't mean that everything that is entangled is the same. Fantastic. Thank you. The modern myth is often more authorized, it is believed to be more real, it is believed to be dominant over others, even without justification, even if it remains equally mythical as everything else. As a writer who writes about the pluriverse and who thinks to these issues, how, how does that writing and relation, as in the sense of like telling of your experience and your thinking, how does it partake in the, in the struggle to, to contest mm -hmm. the authorization? of the modern myth, yeah. and how does that authorization work? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, th there are several uh, aspects to it. You know, one has to do with uh, this, this issue of asymmetry. So we have this multiplicity of, uh, of realities or worldings, um, but there are things that can be done and are done that make some realities less real in a way. Uh, and if you can use uh, the moment of editing this, perhaps you can put the the image of the of the bird rabbit, so that uh, the viewers can 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 follow. So you you have both there. If you make a little bit of effort, move your eyes, you can see both. Okay, but you could modify that uh, that drawing in such a way that what systematically comes first to your view is, let's say, the rabbit. Okay, and you really have to make a really hard effort to be able to see the, the bird. Okay, something similar happens with realities that are entangled, and that's something that the modern myth does as it, as it is enacted permanently. Um, imagine that the rabbit is the modern world, okay, and the bird will be kind of uh, the, the Ishido world, and the rabbit says, OK, uh, I'm going to cut my ears because I can make shoes with the ears and it's better for, for me. Uh, and it's just go and chop it. The bird might try to fight against it, but the modern world of the rabbit, for which there is only ears, there is no, there is only rabbit, <laughs> there is only ears, there is no big, there is no bird. 
uh, was, oh, it's this, this humans are here complaining about something that they're being unreasonable. What's the, they're not going to die. But suppose that this, this are the, the uh, for the, um, in the Arabic world, the ears are mountains. And for the uh, bird world, these are ancestors. With wood, you cannot sustain a life worth livable. This, your world crumbles if you don't have that relation. Okay, so uh, that's the kind of process which the m- m- modern wording constantly does. It goes imposing, and this is one of the elements that I'm I'm, I'm working through in my latest book, trying to finish. Is precisely looking at how exactly uh, the modern world goes about erasing these other realities, M- make them, making them less, I, I say, less plausible. So that when I mention them, they'll say, no, "What are you talking about? There, there is nothing there." But there is a uh, there is a very practical ways in which this is done materially. Uh, that rest plausibility at these other worlds. Um, so one of the th- things that through my writing I try to do is precisely one, is insisting in the presence of these other worlds there where they might not appear. is kind of a, like a work of, of trying to uh, highlight um, in the drawing of the rabbit and the bear, when the bird has disappeared, mostly from, I go with a highlighter and try to show you, hey, here is the, here is the bird, it's still there. Um, as a way of um, also considering for ourselves that we are not um, bound to the reality in which we are living because it has become more and more clear to most many of us that the modern world in which we live is not very sustainable. And so what I'm doing at the same time as a, as a, as a, as a intellectual, let's say, I am myself an expression of a moment in which modernity is... Uh, you know, is crumbling. It is showing uh, that it cannot sustain itself as it has done it. Uh, so it's like we ourselves, you know, having the possibility of having this discussion is a symptom of that. A few years ago, it would have, would have been impossible to be talking about these sort of things. I mean, it was like, what are you talking about? This is BS through and through. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like that symptom and, and so intensified, intensified through my writing and well, other other kind of uh, uh, work that I do, perhaps more uh, more grounded, uh, more immediate. You know, will, will appear more like land claims and stuff like that. Amazing. Um, I wonder if we could go back um, to the idea that you talked about at the beginning, where you as an anthropologist thought you were going to like help in this liberatory struggle, um, taking your like frameworks and your ideas and using them um, for a positive political end, I guess. Clearly, the the idea of the pluriverse shifts that. Um, a, a, a phrase um, that that you use, um, I believe, is partial connection. That that talks about like you, you're you're never going to have this complete translation where the two worlds completely understand each other because if they did they wouldn't like there's they're both they're this duck rabbit thing right Mm -hmm. and if it was the same thing then that would no longer exist Mm -hmm. Mm um how does that change the the idea of like what politics can be um i'm thinking of uh the idea of cosmopolitics and how you take that up um and and maybe change it a little bit like what is what is going to do political action, which could be in the form of what we might think of as action, or maybe like just political writing or theorizing or philosophy. What does that look like when there's no longer this world in which I can be sure that if it's 
good, then it's good for the other world? Like, how does that, how do you then balance that? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps that, that's the, that's the biggest challenge of, of all the, of all the project. Um, one thing that once you get to, 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 to this notion of the pluriverse, um, it seems to me that there are two, two ways of thinking about it. One is, and, and you're going to see many of, many of that. Uh, there is a lot of discuss, discussions about the pluriverse lately. I don't know if you have come across or this is the first time that you, but if you start to look around, you're going to see, and a lot of books are coming out with the pluriverse. And, but there is one way of understanding the pluriverse in which, in a way, the pluriverse becomes an immanence. It is there all the time, you know? Um, and so a lot of the political uh, concern has to do with, okay, uh, how do we compose common worlds? Uh, and so there is, a, the, there is kind of a movement that always goes from the pluriverse that appears as a multiplicity and an heterogeneity that kind of centrifugal uh, towards uh, composing a common world. It's a, it's, a, it's a movement. Now, within that, there is a, a whole set of, of proposals of how to do it properly because the story will go that moderns, for example, this, this is Latour, Bruno Latour's uh, 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 view. Latour would say, okay, the problem with modernity or with moderns is that they assume that the common world already existed, was the reality that was out there. So what they, when they talk about modernization, what it meant was we're going and get all the other humans uh, gather and bring them into this common world that is known by science. Uh, and so let's get them educated. Once you don't have that common world, which is the proposal of cosmopolitics, though you have a pluriverse, still the movement keep going in the same direction. Uh, is let's compose the common world. So it was not there, it has to be done. It has to be constructed. But uh, m one of the questions that I, I pose to this is uh, why the pluriverse appears as a problem to begin with. And particularly in the situation in which we are nowadays, when we have the Anthropocene and all these uh, narratives about, you know, extinctions and end of world and what we're going to do and how do we compose a proper common world so that we can survive. For me, it's, it's very important to reconsider the pluriverse as something that has to be done, that is not already there. So. I am interested not in, in solving the bird rabbit situation, but in producing that kind of situation. Because what, what we have in the original drawing of the bird rabbit situation is where two different entities exist at the same time, in the same place, without them being only one. Uh, now, in many situations, I think that most of the situations, um, that can happen without even you noticing. Nothing happens. You know, you just go and, and, and unless there is a problem, that's where you realize, oh, there is something else there. And how do you react to that awareness is the key to whether you are going to sustain the pluriverse or you are going to uh, go in the other direction of erasing that uh, point of contact, that partial connection. Because th that notion of partial connection, you know, goes tied to, against with that drawing, imagine that the partial connection is the head and the bodies that do not appear in the image are quite different and go in other directions, okay? Um, but there is a partial connection that occurs in the head of that drawing. Uh, and as long as that can go, both the rabbit and the bird can be. There is two, or more than two, or less than two. Uh, there is a multiplicity. Um, for me, that's the political task, is uh, go through situations in which there are um, two worldings at stake, 
and in connection, in parcel connection, the most of the cases in, in which I work, my concern has been with situations in which you have that, but one of those, usually the, 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 the uh, let's say the reality, the subordinated reality is being erased. And I wonder and try to find ways to uh, create that articulation that resembles more the equilibrium in the bird rabbit um, drawing. You know? In the book, you talk about various uh, approaches to try to disrupt the modern view or the modern myth um, within academic scholarship, philosophy, anthropology, etc. Um, and as we've sort of discussed, um, I love the the dog tail analogy. Um, like in trying to describe this, in doing these performances, it kind of inevitably performs the reality that it's trying to disrupt. Y your work has gone in different directions, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to um, what does it mean to theorize from a modern context and how might disciplines like philosophy, history, like, do you have any thoughts to how that those other disciplines or scholarship can be done in a way that, um, that does do this um, kind of pluriversal building? A phrase you use, or maybe an image you use, um, I believe towards the end of your book, is like collective improvisation, where like, th there's like a harmonious, each person each member of the band is doing their own thing, but they're, and they're not like uh, interchangeable, but they're all collectively harmonizing. Um, so like, this is a, a philosophy podcast, this is a philosophy YouTube channel. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to like, how do we go back to philosophy and, and do that while not trying to, or while not inevitably like reaffirming the modern position or the modern myth? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think that the, the, what it seems to me the obvious is the only way you do that is with others. Uh, and to the extent that uh, any discipline, you know, but philosophy particularly as the mother of all the disciplines, um, um, there is, there is a, a, a very strong tendency uh, to speak inwards it seems to me i mean i have i have come across really interesting stuff in in, in philosophy but the most interesting thing that i have found I, are those that open up a little bit to engage with that which completely go out of the canon but part of that also i think that has to do with um really how to stop uh, something that I have seen several times that I have engaged with colleagues in philosophy, which is almost like a, a, a knee-jerk reaction to something. Oh, that was said by Heidegger. Oh, no, that was said by this other. Oh, that was said by... And, and say, take your time, because my sound similar, my resonate a lot, but it's not exactly the same. And the difference is key. The difference is really key. Um, so... Yeah, that, that will be mostly, you know, I, I think that, that that opening up to those other uh, other traditions of thought, of course, it also involves that you have to um, um, invest a little bit less on keep reading the different canons of uh, modern philosophy and invest a little bit of time dedicating because it's, it's not easy, you know, you, you enter other languages and, and, and it's always in translation, of course. So it's, it's never that you are really going to get, but the pool that it has, the translation or trying to think across, I think that is very, very enriching and it can be really, uh, and, and there are actually, um, you know, a, a few efforts that I have, I have seen around, uh, I, I will mention like uh, um, um, a guy that is called Scott Pratt that has a very interesting book that is called Indigenous or Native American Pragmatism, uh, where he plays very interestingly in, in trying to rethink pragmatism, American pragmatism, with this proposal 
that he throws around that actually that pragmatism arises from relations with indigenous uh, philosophies. Uh, uh, then I have come across uh, uh, other guys, uh, other uh, other scholars. I'm thinking people like um, uh, um, Burkhardt, uh, that is a guy that I constantly go back to, to a couple of little things that he has that are really, uh, they keep open in my, my mind. Uh, so, you know, just like having those, uh, those conversations there, I think that will be very, very enriching on that direction. Fantastic. And I mean, almost on this point of thinking collectively, and thinking in ways that go beyond just like your own narrow world. It reminds me of the anthology you edited, um, A World of Many Worlds, I think, and and the dictionary of the of post-development and the pluriverse, like all of these projects that are really collective projects, you know, and that many of the people in there you probably disagree with on details or like don't think exactly the way you do. And it's a strange kind of interdisciplinary project, you know, like part of an intellectual community that almost avows and accepts those differences. What is it like to work in, in such a community of intellectuals that you said has been growing and that pluriverse is even more and more important in many books? Like, um, has that changed um, the way that people discuss it and actually apply it and think about it? Has it become maybe even more powerful or even neutralized, you know, all of yeah, these yeah. questions. Well, all of the, all of the above. I mean, one of the things that happens is that, I mean, one is that I think, you know, this, this sort of stuff, they just come, come with the times because many of the discussions or conversations about the pluriverse have nothing to do with uh, the sort of thing that, uh, for example, Marisol de la Cadena and Arturo Escobar and myself have been thinking about. Uh, but are points of resonances. Uh, so, for example, the, one of the particularities of uh, political ontology um, is that the way that we came to all this stuff for us was we started with a very concrete set of problems uh, that were taking place in South America at the turn of the century. So the, the problem, uh, to put it very succinctly, was this. We were saying that um, was the, 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 the big wave of extractivism has started uh, in, in South America. Well, it was really not started, but it was prolonging. And one of the things that happened was that a lot of progressive governments, even in Bolivia, where uh, in, uh, Evo Morales had been elected president, the indigenous president, um, very quickly, grassroots communities were uh, fighting with the governments. Um, and this was not the usual fight, you know, oh, corporations coming from outside, blah, blah, blah. No, this, and that's what was more, more visible, this problem, because these were progressive governments that were doing extractivism for the greater good of the nation through redistribution and so on and so forth. Local communities were saying no not to extractivism, in some cases, because they were destroying ancestors, like the ears of the, of the rabbit, okay? But uh, the response from right-wing and left-wing governments were the same to this kind of movement, but saying, oh, these are, this is irrationality. How, how can we even discuss this? This is completely irrational. So for us was like, okay, something is going on here. I have, uh, I had a few years before, you know, during my PhD, I have started to pay attention to this sort of thing, but now we were having, you know, these discussions at the national level. There was presidents coming out saying, this is irrational. When years before, nobody needed to say that this was irrational. It was obvious that it was irrational, you know, so it, it, it never, so for us it was like, okay, how do we, uh, understand how we try to, to, to capture what's going on in these situations without um, resorting to the usual categories that will reduce ancestors, for example, to natural resources or cultural beliefs or this kind of stuff. So that's trigger, you know, so how can we think about this, the reality of this stuff? Um, 
So that's where 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 all started. Now you have other other um, other currents uh, of thinking that come to this problematic, but they come from from different um, uh, engines, if you want. Some are more theoretical. Some uh, perhaps come from other problematics. Uh, so all of all of this. Um, has created a, 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 a space which you have similar concepts being tossed around, uh, but they are not exactly the same. In some cases, I'm very happy to see, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, I've never thought about that. In other cases, oh, no, man, that's, that's, that's pushing the agenda backwards. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you have to, you have to, you know, do a little bit of a, of, a, of a mapping of the terrain to, to see where all these uh, positions are, are playing out. Amazing. Um, this has been a really, really amazing conversation. I want to ask you one more question, okay. um, which is just where your work has, has gone. We've sort of gone almost like a, through a lot of your, your career that this book, um, you know, was, was 13 years ago or something like that. Um, where where are you taking these questions now? Um, and maybe is there are there any threads or, or currents from um, from this book and from your work with the Ishiro that are are still coming through in in the questions that you're exploring now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I have been uh, perhaps uh, going deeper is is trying to one is to think more carefully about where we as, um, or in my case, myself, you know, as a writer, I'm positioned, and what are the kind of problematics that mobilize me? Um, and trying to be more consistent with the consequences of thinking in terms of uh, pre-universal politics and cosmopolitics. Um, so this is this is what I've been working lately, and I have been with a book for too many years already, uh, trying to to get it out. Um, where one of the things that I'm, I'm I'm trying to do is to is to still think um, or think about all these discussions about transition, you know, uh, that are ongoing. Um, try to rethink how the Anthropocene or the so-called Anthropocene is, uh, is posed as a problem and trying to develop a problematic that will be more consistent with what I see as the problem um, or, or the way in which I would like to, to, to define the problem so that other kinds of of actions than what we see developing everywhere. You know, oh, let's decarbonize and let's get uh, just electric vehicles and stuff like that. Um, you know, try to, 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 to tell other stories about what's going on um, on the basis of what I have learned and what I continuously see. Uh, I mean, I continue working with the Shiro. Uh, I just came back uh, a few months ago from being in the communities, you know, and, and that's something that is all the time moving, you know, it's like, uh, for me, you always can see the world in that, if you really look into one place, you see the entire worlds that are being produced because they encounter there in those places, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I am at. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's really, it's really wonderful to be able to hear you speak about these issues and, you know, speak so clearly about something that is frankly really hard to understand from from this modern um, position and and to really be able to learn from you. So so thank you for this conversation. Well, I hope that my 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 uh, conversation was more clear <laughs> <laughs> and not that I messed it up even worse. <laughs> And I mean, yeah, this is only like a, like a taste, you know, it's impossible to explain something like this in just one, one hour, but, 
just um, all of these little insights of what it could be, you know, the Anthropocene, the plausibility, the pluriverse, like all of these ideas are really useful to begin to think. So thank you. Thank you very much.